Hey everybody, I am here at Senex, uh, and Senex is held at a UTAC site, UTAC Millbrook, and I am lucky enough to be uh, speaking today to Connor McCormack. He is the CEO of UTAC. Connor, thanks oh. for, uh, for having me today. It's oh, really thank you for coming along. It's a pleasure. Great to meet you. This is a site that I've been very familiar with for a lot of years. So I've lived in and around the Bedford area. Um, for the last 20 odd years and I've been in the motor industry for a long time so coming here since early 2000s okay um, so you know the Vauxhall days and the other other owners of the business but my first question to you is why do you get up each day oh why do I get up every day well <laughs> um, that's a good question uh, I get up every day now because I'm a real I guess I would call myself a petrol head Okay. And, and to use the old word yeah, phrase, yeah. <laughs> uh, right from I was very small, walking to school where I grew up through uh, in Northern Ireland when I was little, mm. walking to school in the mornings, myself and my mate, we used to have a play a game every day. We were, would try and name the car coming towards you before Brilliant. you saw it. So yeah. we were, myself and my friend were, were into cars from very, very young age. And I'm in a very fortunate position now to be the CEO of the UTAC Group, where I'm heavily involved in the automotive industry, not just on petrol engines, but as we develop now, and, and our customers are developing the next, the next wave of EV platforms. And as you walk around the show today, you'll see hydrogen featuring mm. more and more as well. Yeah, so absolutely. I guess I'm a real passionate automotive guy, and that's what gets me up in the morning. Uh, Fantastic. From a, from a career well, perspective. It, and and. In that career, who's, who's really inspired you or helped you in your career most? I mean, I, as I go through my career, I know like different people probably through my career and, and sort of today you see a lot of the sustainability leaders that are really kind of making a difference. What, what, is it, what is it, who is it and what is it that's helped you? Oh, well, I guess I would say uh, there's probably three key influencers that, I would, that, that have influenced sort of my approach to my career. Right when I was a graduate, when I came from Northern Ireland into, in, into London, uh, I was working, I started my career in finance. So um, the first real memorable mentor that I had was a, a very uh, loud, gregarious Australian guy. Oh, wow. Uh, who was working for, for the company that I joined in the graduate training scheme. And he really sort of, inspired me and lit the fire in me around business and mm. commerce. Mm. Um, so he would be the first person. In the automotive industry, I've met so many fantastic, inspirational leaders, um, be they inside my own business. When I was the CEO of Inchcape in the UK, some of the general managers that we had running our dealerships, I found really inspirational. Mm. Um, and you know, working with all of the OEMs and some of the big national sales companies, we had, uh, you know, I had the pleasure of working with and alongside, you know, the heads of businesses at Jaguar Land Rover, at BMW, at Toyota. Mm. So there have been a number of sort of key influencers that have helped shape my thinking and approach to, to mm. leadership in the automotive industry. And the thing I love about it is it's, it's so dynamic, every day is different. Yeah. Every day's every day's changing, yeah, and, and the industry's now in this phase of transformation. It's just yeah. I find just really inspirational. So I I take my inspiration from lots of different areas. Fantastic. How because I whenever you say to somebody you know why are you in the automotive industry? I mean it does sound like maybe you did want to ultimately get into it. But I mean yeah. I was cleaning cars and fell into the industry back in central London in Edgware Road. But um, today I fell into it, basically. How, how did you get automotive specific? So how did I get automotive specific? I guess I would split my career in two. So the first half of my career, I would say I was a, a product brand person. So I worked in my, my, my CV has got companies like uh, Gillette, L'Oreal on there from, from my early days. So very much consumer goods, big brands. I then moved into retail at B&Q and Kingfisher where I loved the buzz and, the, and, the, and that day-to-day -day immediacy of business and finance. And it was really back in 2004 or 5 when I left B&Q, I stepped into the automotive industry as CFO for Inchcape Retail in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was like a, that was a dream job because it was a combination of finance, right. it was a combination of retail, yeah. it was a combination of cars. And straight away when I started, we started to do deals as well. So we were we were on the acquisition trail. So that was my first 
mm. jump into the automotive industry from yeah. a career perspective. So that was a, that was a match made in heaven, if Absolutely. you like, from a career perspective. Certainly jumped in a bit higher than I'm. Like jumped car in, cleaning. yeah, okay. <laughs> jumped in, a, you know, with a finance background. Those yeah. kind of functional skills are very transferable yeah, from one absolutely. industry to another. Yeah, so. yeah. But a combination of, you know, the finance background, commerce, retail, yeah. brands, yeah. automotive. Yeah. It was just fantastic. Well, you're still here, so you must be uh, enjoying a bit um, of it. Yeah, it's, <laughs> well, it gets into your blood, as they say oh, in the yes. industry. Once it gets into your blood, it's, yeah. uh, it, it, tends to, it tends to stay in there. You've you either got it in your veins or you haven't. And I you think can check out, but you can veins. never leave. <laughs> 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 so you joined UTAC in 2020. Uh, yeah. We share that kind of uh, transitional in COVID kind of journey. Taking on the role of CEO, how was that transition into, to, I mean, because you've been a CFO, you've done all that sort of stuff, but coming into the business in a really difficult time, what was that like? I think, um, you know, whenever I joined Millbrook as it was then, so this is pre-Millbrook being owned by, right. by UTAC, I came in for the previous owner, who was a, a PLC in the UK. Mm. So I came in to do the carve out of the Millbrook business from from the then owner mm. to, to for it to be sold to the UTAC group. So I had come in with daily experience, I'd come in with automotive experience. For some bizarre reason, the whole way through my career, I've had some kind of connection to French companies. Okay. Uh, and it just so happened that there was a, it was like a, everything seemed to merge together yeah. quite good. So I, I joined in September 2020 to do the Millbrook sale to, yeah. to UTAC Saram. Uh, I already had the, the CEO CFO experience, so seeing that bit through the the initial deal phase, getting the deal done, post acquisition integration, mm. during COVID, was a real learning experience. Yeah. You know, and that's what you know. You're never every day you learn something new. Mm. Um, and then more recently, we've changed the governance structure in the group, and I stepped up to become group CEO in March of this year. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, I find it's easier. It's the second time I've transitioned up into a CEO from within an existing organization. Right. That has got huge advantages because mm. you know the business, you know mm. the culture, you know the politics, yeah. you know the strengths and weaknesses of the group yeah. uh, and the organization. So that's, that's made the, you know, the, the step into this CEO role you know, quite seamless. And I think CEO is a, is a very ethereal kind of job title, right? I mean, we've got CEOs of companies that are startups that really yeah. just do everything. And there are CEOs of global companies, much like this kind of environment. How do you see your CEO role? How would you define it? Uh, I would define my role as being three things. Okay. Uh, I would say it's about defining the strategy. It's about engaging with your key stakeholders and it's about communicating down and inspiring the team to come with you on that journey to deliver yeah. the strategy on behalf of the key stakeholders. So that's how I would, you know, when people say, you know, you're a CEO, what does that mean? And I, yeah. I say it's about, it's about communicating, it's about working with your key stakeholders yeah. and it's about being clear for the strategy that you want to implement. Do you know what I think that is? Uh, it's a testament to you that you've been able to um, like condense that into Lots of CEOs will say I'm dramatically <laughs> simplifying things, but I'm a great believer in simplifying Absolutely. things. Absolutely. But, but isn't it great that everybody understands your role? I understand your role. Mm. You know, what you're aiming to achieve from, from all of that. And I, I think that's because it's, really, um, it's a really difficult thing. So you've been at UTAC now. If you're a petrol head and spent time at Millbrook, you know, you know that they flipped the Aston Martin a world record number of times down this track. Mm -hmm. Have you been round it yourself? Have you? Have yeah, you, have I've, been taken yeah round I've been round not just this track, but all of our tracks now. So yeah. uh, we in the group, we're very fortunate not just to have the, the track here at Millbrook, which yeah. is, as you said yourself, very historic, but with, mm. a, with, a, with a huge history. So yeah, I've been around the the bowl here and the, and the circuits here. The off road track here is amazing as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. But I'm equally, our circuits that we have in Montreuil in France, which next year celebrates its 100th anniversary. In fact, no next way. year. Oh my uh, so we're gearing ourselves up for uh, for a big centenary event next year to celebrate awesome. Montreuil's 100th birthday. Yeah. Uh, I've been around the tracks at Mortfontaine. We've got tracks in Finland that have been round. Tracks in Morocco that have been round. So yeah, it's uh, you know. 
it's it's not that hard a job. Whenever, whenever you have days like that, when you're on the track, going yeah. around in a nice car yeah, yeah. with somebody who can really handle the car, you yeah. sometimes you have to pinch yourself and realize Absolutely. how lucky you are. Scariest moment and favorite moment? In a car? Yeah, around around the tracks. Uh, my, uh, I'm not, a, I do like off-roading, but I there's a, yeah. there's a, particular piece of our off-road circuit here that yeah. we have a very highly qualified off-road driver yeah. who on my second or third day when I joined <laughs> decided to uh, pass my metal shall we say Brilliant. that was uh, that was hair raising it makes the hairs in the back of your neck stand up on your white yeah. knuckles gripping the gripping the gripping the gripping the, uh, the door handle so yeah. that's probably the scariest moment the best moment for me ever in a car I was very fortunate, probably 10 years ago, I went to Abu Dhabi with a, with a premium brand yep. for a new vehicle launch and they had uh, some of their DTM touring cars there for experiences mm. and I got into the DTM touring car with their professional driver around the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix circuit wow. at Yas Marina. That was on one hand the most frightening thing that I've ever done but on the other hand the most adrenaline filled yeah, yeah, yeah. you get out of the car afterwards and it was just every all of your senses were on were on tender hooks so that's Fantastic. that was both the uh, the worst and the best <laughs> <laughs> that is great and and um you know I think because I, I mean learning about UTAC and and your multi-country kind mm -hmm. of approach now so you're really helping manufacturers and how do you see that the landscape has, has changed, particularly over the last two or three years with the, the real focus on sustainability and that yeah. drive to different drive chains, different fuel types that we've already talked about? Um, how are you seeing it? Who's doing it well? How do you see UTAC meeting those needs? Uh, I see you know, what, what I think our unique proposition for customers are is that we have, you know, we have a platform business in the US that is the leading outsource provider for EV motor, e-motor e, e testing in the US. So we've got two facilities in the US and they are supporting both the emerging EVs, the newcomers, you know, Tesla arguably now is a mature business, but yeah. you have other startups out there like Lucid and Rivian mm. and people like that that we're, that, that we're working hard to support. Also our big lab in Detroit where we've just invested a significant amount of cash uh, last year and this year mm. in expanding our footprint in Detroit to support the big three in Detroit. Right. Uh, so we're seeing you know, their pace of the move into electrification really mm. accelerating now. Uh, so we've got the opportunity, that's an advantage for us in terms of we're seeing what's coming west from, fr from the US. At the same time our, you know, our sales team in China are working hard with you know the emerging OEMs from Asia to look yeah. at look at their products. And are they testing coming here, or are they're they now? You know, there's lots of speculation and news in the press about you know the Chinese OEMs are coming to Europe, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and that's where we think we add the value with our range of test services or homologation services mm. that we can offer yeah. uh, OEMs that want to launch vehicles in the European market. We also are Euro NCAT accredited. And when you combine all of that functional aspects of, of launching new vehicles with our ability to do connectivity and simulation and, mm. and, 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 and the newer technologies as well, I think that's what makes our proposition really unique for, for customers. But we can see the same, th the same themes are all now starting to converge mm. around you know, cleaner drive lines to get better mobility. Safety is still remains mm. paramount. But this aspect of connectivity and infotainment, you know, we all have got our iPhones or whatever device we use and we yeah. want them connected instantaneously yeah. to whatever vehicle you get into yeah, yeah. And, and, and that level of always connected. Yeah. We see those as the sort of the big themes that everybody is now sort of mm. starting to converge on. There's, I mean, it was interesting listening to Jesse Norman this morning, and we we heard from him that 2035 obviously is is still absolutely it was in legislation. We know that. Um, we also heard him confirm really the Z mandate as well, which which is very clear about the thing. We 2030 was absent. I was curious as to that, 
But I'm not going to ask you for comment on that. Don't worry. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> but I will. But what I did want to ask you was the Zev mandate. I mean, do you really think that that should be ratified and confirmed into legislation, or is it okay in its in its woolly format at the minute because it's not confirmed? I think, you know, and this is personally, mm. I think setting hard and fast deadlines for legislation in an industry that's in the middle of transforming is not always a good thing. Okay. So I think having a degree of flexibility as the industry needs to flex to meet global incidents or global crisis. So, mm. you know, five years ago, nobody had ever heard of COVID. The industry is still recovering from that. Yeah. Three years ago, there was no crisis in Ukraine. The industry has been impacted by that. We're now starting to look at the impact of both of those events on global supply chain and everything else. Eventually, all of that needs to flow into production plans, launch plans for vehicles, mm. uh, net zero plans eventually. Uh, and also, you know, not just in this country, but global infrastructure to be able to support the number of EVs or the number of hydrogen vehicles that we mm. need to get onto the road. That's a huge unknown that governments all around the world are, 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 mm. are, are, are working very hard to define what their own national needs are. So I think it's better to have a bit of a looser framework with a clear strategic intent that it is the road to net zero, but to put a, a firm you know, yardstick in the ground whenever you're mid-transformation, I think, is difficult to do. Mm. I suppose, though, it's fair to say, though, that the Zev mandate and, and this, the, the, the dates in time are actually probably playing into the UTAC um, wheelhouse, in a sense, in that manufacturers are obviously having to do a lot of work now to, to transition to different drivetrains and different fuel types and all of those kinds of things. Um, what are you doing to upskill your teams? Because I know people are really important in the values that mm -hmm. you, you have as, as UTAC. What are you doing to upskill your teams and, and equip all of your sites? I mean, the, the battery storage facility or the battery testing facility and things like that. You know, what, what's going on for you guys in that Yeah, respect? so, uh, you know, we, I talk about leadership the UTAC way, which is based on our UTAC values yeah. of integrity, innovation and expertise. Clearly, mm -hmm. two things of those are playing right into the heart of what's going on in the industry transformation at the minute with mm -hmm. innovation and expertise. So we, uh, we, we're continuing to invest in the hardware, as I call it, new mm -hmm. facilities, new testing capabilities. Mm -hmm. We've got our, our battery test facility here that we're expanding. Mm -hmm. We've got EDU, e-motor test cells that we're continuing to invest in. We've got hydrogen capability here on site that we're continuing okay. to invest in. Yeah. So our, our investment in hardware is very closely aligned to where we see the industry going and the demand that we're seeing being generated by customers out the back of legislation and, mm. and, 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 and longer term environmental targets for their own businesses. So we're continuing to invest in the hardware and from a software perspective, the people, you know, we're, we're continuing to recruit through our technician programs, our graduate programs, we're developing our engineers through the engineering pathways that we see, um, our engineers who join us as you know, graduate engineers moving through principal engineers, senior engineers, master engineers, chief engineers. So we've got a very clear um, technical training roadmap that we uh, that we're pursuing with the teams from a from a technical perspective, and likewise from a commercial perspective, and in all of our support functions where we're we're investing heavily in sort of training and development of our people. I'm a huge believer in that. I've I personally have seen huge steps forward in my career from, from investing in training and development. So mm. it's something that I'm a real strong proponent of in our business. Brilliant. And, and I think, you know, aligned to that, you, you're actually having to make a huge investment in, in almost everything, aren't you? A huge investment in, in the people, but I love that, that that's the first port of call because for me, that's one of the most important elements of our industry. The people mm -hmm. are, are so valuable. Um, how is it trying to get a balance between that huge investment of both in people but also in the hardware that you've talked about with also making a profit for your uh, shareholders? Because it's a difficult time, isn't it? Yeah. A, a really heavy demand on investment. Yeah. Are you having to sort of plan it out longer or is it? are you still being able to kind of 
keep both happy. Well, that's back to the box number two that I talked about is that, you know, the role of a CEO is about managing the stakeholders and communicating with the stakeholders. So, you know, one of the key stakeholders obviously is our shareholders. Mm. Uh, and part of that, we've got a, at the start of every year, we do a very clear budget that we then reforecast as we go through the year. A key element of that is capex and what we're going to invest mm. for in the hardware, yeah. but also uh, it's not just for one year. We're right in the middle now of doing a plan for the next three years that will take the horizon out to three years mm. so that I can take the opportunity now to share with the shareholders how much commitment we need to make to ensure that UTAC stays at the, at, at the front edge of, of providing the, the types of mobility services that we need to offer our customers. So we, we look it out to, we're right now in the middle of doing our three year business plan. Really exciting. It's, it's good that I, I love getting really nice straight answers from the difficult questions. Like I said, I like to keep, sim I <laughs> keep, like to keep simple. things simple. Well, okay, so one of the things that I uncovered as I was researching, so I'm, I'm really interested in sustainability people and transport, you know, that's, those are my, my things. But what I, know, what I noticed was that you have beehives in France. You didn't, think, didn't see that coming, did you? I didn't see that one. <laughs> <laughs> you have beehives. And, and, and the reason I, t I asked the question about this is I actually went to see some beehives at the weekend. Okay. And it just, it, it was a... a, I have a, 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 a good a, friend of ours is an apiarist, actually. Oh, there you go. They, yeah. That's the word that I couldn't remember, but you've just... Uh, there, but is there any plan to put some here? I think we're open to you know we're open to everything in terms of our environmental projects that we've been running specifically on this site. Mm. For example, in the middle of last year, uh, we planted something like five thousand trees on the site here oh, okay. as part of our uh, oh, as part of our environmental the road down. commitment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you will have if you come down the board, you will see Just that there's a lot of yeah. a whole bank of new trees. Yeah. So um, and we we do that because we are very conscious of the industry that we're working in. Mm. You know. Our strap line for the group is, you know, your trusted experts for safer and cleaner mobility. Yeah. You know, and um, if if we say that, we have to live it. Yeah. So it's about making things safer here on site for mm. for our colleagues and for our customers. Mm. But it's also it's not just about developing cleaner mobility for for our customers. It's mm. about making sure our sites are mm. safe and clean for yeah. for our colleagues and for yeah. for the broader um, ecosystem that we yeah. sit within. So. Yeah. Yeah, we're open to open to all sorts of ideas. We've uh, we've got a, a permanent um, CSE manager, right? Who who advises us on on what we need to be doing. Yeah. We're, we're you know we're committed to reducing our carbon footprint. We've mm. got the, the metrics and measures and everything else in yeah. place inside the inside the business to 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 start driving down our carbon footprint. Yeah. I mean, many people won't know how beautiful this site is. It, it is an incredible you a good site. Data come. It's a fantastic. Oh place. yeah, and and but you know the the hills and then yeah. the views from the tops of the hills, and especially the off-road course yeah. and things yeah. like that. But I'm I'm also very conscious. There's a lot of development going on around this very area. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a brilliant opportunity, and I I would love and I'd love to come and help do the beehives if you ever do that because I only live locally so oh, do you? Yeah, you'd yeah, be yeah. More, than, more than welcome I'll, 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 pass, your, I'll pass your contact absolutely details not that our, I'm an apiarist but you know yeah. there we go um, within your values there's a real focus on people yeah. as we t the, really the first and the third value both sort of really encapsulate what you do with people in particular but how do you reward your teams and ensure that, that even in a 24-7 environment, because it really is, isn't it? When the events are on like this, the, the teams are having to work late, start early. How do you keep them incentivized and how do you reward them uh, in, that, in that sort of I think, motivational I think, way? I think it's a, it's a never evolving, you know, constantly, constantly, changing, uh, constantly changing way that we do it. First and foremost for me, I think the spoken word means a lot. Mm. I think. You know the opportunity for me and my executive team to go and visit sites, say a well done to, per, mm. to well well done to people, really lifts people totally. lifts people's heads. Mm. Um, we've got a special recognition scheme inside the business, which is a peer to peer recognition scheme, where if somebody, nice. if I see you go on the extra mile mm -hmm. uh, on behalf of a customer or another colleague, we can mm. nominate you for an award. Uh, so we do peer-to-peer -peer recognition. We have all of the normal, traditional comps and bands packages mm. to make sure that we're retaining retaining uh, the right talent. Yeah. We've got performance-oriented bonus schemes. Mm. 
Uh, but I'm a great believer in the softer side of motivation, you know, regular communication. So this afternoon I'll be having a, a leadership briefing with my broader leadership team, not just the executive committee, but the top 30 managers that we have in the business. And that's uh, uh, the back to school sort of motivating <laughs> speech after the summer holidays. Summer holidays. So we've got August the, is a tough month, isn't it? It, it is really a tough month. Is a tough month. It is. Oh. So we've got the... Uh, we've got the uh, the, the kick off, the back to school kick off meeting this afternoon with the manager. So I'm a great believer in communication, yeah. uh, as well as you know the harder forms of harder forms of reward and recognition. Brilliant. And so my personal passion is the van sector, um, but the trucks as well. So vans and trucks Every because side. the commercial, yeah. the commercial world. Um, so it was. It's interesting for me to get your view as being somebody being right up at the front of the development and the and the changes in technology. How do you see the van and truck industry in comparison to where the cars are at? So obviously cars have, are well on the way on the J curve, you know, in t because it has to begin here, right? It has to begin in development. It has to begin in testing. How are you seeing? the van and the truck market begin to scale up towards this transition towards electrification? Yeah. yeah, listen, we've seen, you know, obviously, because we host LCV and we've hosted LCV for, for a number of years, yeah. we've, we've seen the trends emerging over the last sort of 15 years or so as, as, as first it was hybrids and, mm. and, and stuff like that. But what we've really seen, and it's really noticeable this year, the, the rise of, you know, hydrogen, in in in, okay. in 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 the lexicon of what everybody's talking about, and yeah. it's and I think it is the van and truck and bus sector that's that, that's that's really driving that. You've got mm. the Toyota hydrogen Hilux that's been unveiled this morning. It's inside. Yeah. Uh, Let me look got, at that. I didn't know that was yeah. there. <laughs> Be there later. Yeah. So <laughs> you've got that inside. You've which is a you know one of the sort of workhorse commercial vehicles mm -hmm. in the UK fleets. Yeah. Um, You'll see hydrogen buses running around yeah. that, that we're doing testing on. Mm. Um, you'll see trucks and all of. Yeah. So I think yes, you're right. The the lighter vehicles, the um, the passenger car segment have, have accelerated mm. far, faster into electrification. Mm. But I think because of the engineering specificities related to the heavier, you know, commercial vehicles, buses, trucks, mm. they need a different power source, and that's where you know that's where. I think my own personal view for the future is that there will be multiple different power sources to suit that individual vehicle's mm. needs. I don't think it's a, it's definitely not a one size fits definitely all, no, um, fits mm. all solution that we're looking at here. I think it'll be a combination of electrification, hydrogen, um, alternative fuels, mm -hmm. uh, depending on what that, what that, what that vehicle needs are. Indeed. And so I have a very important question. What's your favorite van? <laughs> my favorite van. Favorite van. My favorite van. Well, my other, my other. Uh, so I, I also do some. I'm the non-exact chair of a automotive retail City, group called Citygate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're a, they're a big Volkswagen, um, Volkswagen Audi partner. So I would have to say it's going to be my, my It's probably not a commercial vehicle, yeah. the Volkswagen California. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's based on the transporter. Based on the yeah, transporter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I like the California. Uh, although I do like them. I do like the I do like the Mercedes Benz. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I and that's, I'm a bit biased because they're the two commercial vehicle brands that we run. Whenever it was an inch kit. Okay. Yeah. So you're, not, you're basically it's, you're not allowed to say anything else. I'm, so well, <laughs> I'm not allowed. They're the two brands that I know the best. Let's let's say it that. To one. be fair, so Mercedes was a brand I worked with for a lot of years. So yeah. the Mercedes Benz Vito is yeah. is is a is one. I'd probably go with the VW ID bus because I'm I focus on the electric. But anyway, that's okay. We'll let you have that one. Um, what car do you drive? And what would you drive if nothing mattered? <laughs> I currently drive an Audi e-tron. Okay. Uh, so I was a bit of an early adopter. So my Audi e-tron is now coming up for three years old. Okay. Um, I love it. I think it's fantastic for, for what I need. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's got a 200 mile range. Mm. Uh, home to back is, is no problem. Yeah. I love the feeling. It's a real premium feeling. So I, I nice. do, I mm. do like the, I do like the, um, I do like the feel of it. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if it was no object, mm -hmm. that's a tough question, because in, 
When I worked in retail, I had the huge privilege of being able to drive pretty much any car I wanted when yeah, I was the yeah. CEO at Inchcape. Mm. Still, the petrol head is still inside me going. With, with no, yeah. no, nothing else mattered, it's fine. Yeah, I would have to probably, a favorite engine is definitely an AMG. Okay. They are cracking engines, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, I do yeah. like, yeah, my, probably my favorite car that I had when I was, at, when, when I was a CEO at Inchcape was a, when I, just after they launched the new S-Class Coupe, I had an, S, an S63 AMG Coupe. Wow, okay. And that was, I look back and that and go, yeah, <laughs> give me one of those any day. So my son is um, a technician at uh, Sitna oh, okay. uh, in Bedford. Oh, okay. Uh, Mercedes. Great, Sitna's a great group. Yeah, yeah. They're a fantastic retailer. Absolutely, group. and um, he, he texts me, or said, you know, WhatsApp me a, uh, the sound of the AMG he was working on like, and just kind of was revving it and revving it. But oh, anyway. one of the, yeah, I got to visit the AMG factory in Germany, or, you know, to go watch the guys mm. build the engine. It's, yeah. it's a bit special. Yeah. I'm a bit biased from the time at Inchcape, but yeah. it's, yeah, I do, love, I do love the AMG product. Definitely, okay. AMG product. So let's go the other, other side then. What's your favorite thing about electric vehicles? Uh, I, like, I like the immediacy of the torque. Mm -hmm. So the petrol you know, head in you. Yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, that yeah. still makes the hairs in the back of your neck stand up. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess it's to do with the speed and the handling. I, I, I like that. I like the notion that you know eventually eventually more of the world will get to experience the pleasure of driving a, a, a pure EV as well. Mm. Um, for the sake of the environment and I know there's a debate about, you know, end to end the sustainability and the yeah. environmental impact of batteries etc etc but you know zero emissions coming out of the tailpipe whenever you're commuting does make you think differently yeah absolutely i mean the ULES and the clean air zones around the country and, yeah. and, and ella's law if you're familiar with it yeah. the, the rules going around about the the air quality is about a human right yeah, yeah it's a so human right so yeah. i like to yeah i do you know that's uh that makes me feel that I'm living the values yeah. of, 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 of you know, yeah. the business and, 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 and what I'm asking people to do for us. And what do you dislike the most? About the EVs? Mm. The whole, you know, the moment that we can get to wireless charging, fantastic. Okay. I hate the faff of getting the cable out and plugging it in. And okay. If we can get to wireless over the air fast charging, I think that would be uh, either that or where you drive in and the battery drops out and there's a new yeah. battery goes up in the bottom, something yeah. like that. I don't know. The, the They're so near or on their way with that, aren't they? The fan, you so know, some of the, you know, I've seen some moped companies that are into yep. interchangeable Just, batteries now as yep. well. And so I think the technology's coming, Yeah. but they, that idea of having to... The ultimate inconvenience, basically, is what, yeah. Or yeah. the, the, the and, inconvenience and I guess charging. it's no different yeah. to having to pull up at a petrol station and fill the tank, but it's, it's mm. still a bit of a, it's still a bit of a faff. Charging convenience, I guess. Is, charging convenience, yeah. I guess, is what is, is, is. And what's your experience of public charging? Uh, I'm going to do a, yeah, it's getting better. Mm. Getting better. It's probably a good place to leave it, isn't it? It's getting <laughs> better. It's getting better. It can be. I, did, I, I have my last, biggest meltdowns. Well, no, yeah. Last last year we uh, last year I went up to Scotland in the Audi. Right. Um, and that was that was an experience that I won't be repeating. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Uh, I know the feeling. <laughs> I, I'm, I normally uh, normally do, well. In, in fact, I do most of my journeys in in my car, and I've got uh, 280 miles range in in my Kia e Nero. Yeah. Uh, and that nice usually car. with yeah, it's a great car, but yeah. it's, I'm su constantly surprised by it. But um, yeah, it's uh, the longer journeys when you have to do two or three charging episodes yeah, the, are yeah, the challenging. To, yeah, we did three charging stops. Yeah. On motorway, fast yeah. chargers yeah. were, yeah, yeah. Mm. not 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 the best experience. So before before I ask you um, sort of any any other biscuits, the the important question for me is of course <clears throat> rugby or football. Oh, uh, I'm I'm fifty fifty actually. Are you? So. Uh, I Football, I'm a Liverpool supporter and have been okay. since I was a we very small friends. lad. We are now friends, that's fine. So I've been a Liverpool supporter all my life. Yeah, um, 
rugby, yeah, international is not so much club rugby, so I'm looking forward to being able to give my French colleagues lots of stick at the, uh, <laughs> Let's as hope. the Rugby World Cup kicks off. Let's hope. Yeah, Let's so hope. I'm a passionate Ireland rugby fan. Yes, good. Uh, myself and all the family are all sort of passionate Ireland rugby fans. So, yeah, yeah really looking forward to the, uh, the World Cup kicking well, off. Well, you guys are on a high, aren't you, at the minute? Well... Um, Number one team in the world brings with it its uh, its, own, its own sort of yeah. pressures, but, but you've earned it, and and you uh, certainly from the Six Nations. Yeah, well, let's hope. I hope we haven't peaked too let's soon. Hope. We're in a tough half of the draw as well. We have to beat the French to. We have to beat the French. Not to get so to the They oh, one know. day they're good, the next day they're meh. <laughs> Play it at home. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. So listen, I you you've graced my questions very beautifully, and I, I really appreciate it. I, I'm conscious, Connor, that you there's a lot of innovation going on within UTAC and a lot of key things that you're doing to to develop um, your own business and and what what is it that's front of mind for you at the moment? Oh, front of mind for me, front of mind for me at the minute is is talent and expertise. Wow. Okay. I think the industry is is under severe pressure from a lack of talent coming into the industry uh, and actually I think the automotive industry, our industry in particular within that, we're being targeted quite heavily by some of the complementary industries that sit around us uh, like wind farms and mm, energy yeah. and everybody else who who are who have suddenly woken up to electric yeah. and electrical engineering needs yeah. and you know I think I think the, the war for talent is mm. probably the number one priority for me at the moment. Fantastic. Well, Connor, listen, thank you so much for today. I've, I've really enjoyed it. I hope, I hope you've got Hasn't across. Hasn't been too painful. <laughs> I, I, I was going to go for the juggler on 2030, but I thought, <laughs> no, I'll let you away with that one. It's, it's, it's a tough one. It really is a tough one. And, and of course, we could debate the hydrogen electric kind of thing. Uh, I, think, yeah, I, think we're looking at, I think we're looking at a multi-fuel future as well. I, I, like I, I agree with that. I really do. As long as it's zero emission, I don't have, a, I don't have an issue with it. Um, I think it's... It's going to be interesting to see at what weight, which fuel type Our wins out. Oh, segment site, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, that's the absolutely. Thing. But uh, Conor McCormick, thanks ever so much for today. I really appreciate it. You're very it. welcome, Paul. Thank you very much. <laughs>